Ladies and gentlemen, our uh, Courtside Art. Alliance Church Choir. Come Children's on up, choir. gang. Come, come on, on up. up. <laughs> oh, come on up. Dave, come on up. Come on up, Navi, over here. The little one's in the front. Okay. Come on, Clover, over here. Get right in front, Navi. Right in front. Okay, turn around, Navi, and face everybody. Hey, attention. light up? Okay, everybody got your light? This little light of mine He's got the whole world in his hand. 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 He's got the little bitty baby in his hand. He's got the little bitty baby in his hand. He's got the little bitty baby in his hand. He's got the whole world in Brothers, he's got you and me, brothers. In his hand, he's got you and me, brothers. In his hand, he's got you and me, brothers. In his hand, he's got the whole world in his hand. Okay, how about sisters? You and me, sisters.
got everybody here. Got everybody here. He's got the whole. Yeah, take a bow. Take a bow. Come on, Navi, take a bow. All right. I hope you guys are doing well this morning. Everyone full from Thanksgiving? No? Well, if you weren't, you didn't show up for the church's potluck because I was full for the whole day after that. It was, it was great. Um, so any, any history buffs in the, in the group today? Um, World War II, not not really, just just a few. Uh, World War II. Um, I don't know. Have you guys heard of this name, Hero? And I'm going to butcher the last name, Onada, Onoda. Um, this guy, he died in ni- in 2014 at the age of 91. Uh, he's a Japanese soldier. Um, you might not know his name, but you might know his story. So he was on um, what's it called? Lung Bang Island near the Philippines, and he was given one order when he was a young lieutenant. He was told, you conduct uh, guerrilla warfare, and you don't die. And so for the next 29 years, he followed orders. After the war was over, he continued to um, do guerrilla warfare and to not die. In fact, he was the last one of the of a, of a group of four. Three others were with him. One left about 1950. He left the jungles. Um, the other two died. He was the last one. And the American government, the Japanese government, they would send in parties to try to get him to come out because the war was over and the Philippine uh, people didn't exactly like the fact that there was still a Japanese soldier killing people. Um, under his leadership, 30 people died as they were doing these raiding parties. And so they would send in leaflets. They would send in people. And he actually said he didn't believe the leaflets because they weren't uh, correct. They weren't grammatically correct um, Japanese. And so he just figured it was a ploy by the, by the Americans. And so that he kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And so finally what they did was they flew in his commanding officer that gave him those orders to finally go in and rescind those orders. But it was almost three decades from when he was told to start to when he finally ended. And it's crazy how he continued to believe that the war was going on even though there were so many things telling him that the war was over. It's an amazing and he was one, I think there was another one that went, another soldier in a different area that went a little longer. But it's amazing that he continued to fight when everything else was telling him not to. He continued to believe that the war was going when everything was telling him not to. When the world had moved on, he didn't because his belief was, no, I'm here. This is what I have to do. And so we're finishing up the book of Mark today. Now, we have been in the book of Mark as a church for two years, um, we have done 41 weeks. We usually take off the winter time, but I thought, you know, we need to probably finish this off. I don't know how many people are getting bored, but we probably need to finish that off. And so we've been doing this for 41 weeks. I looked at my little computer and how many words have been typed. It's over 100,000 words that I've had to say. <laughs> it's a lot of words. And so we're coming to the end. We're in the last chapter today. And uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, so, and so we're in this last chapter. And for those of you who are brand new, you're going, what is going on in this church? <laughs> and so... But this, we've been at this, and we're coming to this point where it's a belief, it's a question of belief today. 
Just like Hero had a question of belief and he was believing something that wasn't true, we have a, we're coming to a point of belief today, a question of what we believe. And so if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Mark chapter 16. And we're going to do the whole thing. We're going to do a whole chapter today. But as we get into it, we need to know a couple of things. We need to kind of give a recap of what's going on in the book of Mark. Because we've been trying to discover where is the Spirit moving in the book of Mark. Not just analyzing the passages, because we can do that. We can go through and verse by verse and dissect it all. But what we're trying to figure out is what is the overarching theme of the book of Mark. And so, really, we've been dividing it up as we go, but really there's four ways to divide it in what we're doing. And so the first one is this. In chapters 1 through 4, we saw that Mark was trying to get across a very specific thing. Jesus had authority. He had authority over the Word of God, so people would hear him, they go, wow, this guy is an amazing speaker. But then also he had authority over the physical realm, he was doing all these types of healings, and he was doing all these miracles, and so we got to see all that. But then on top of that, he also had authority over the spiritual realm. He would cast out demons, and he would forgive sins. And so in the first opening chapters of the book of Mark, we see that Jesus has this authority. But after that, we see a, a shift in Jesus' approach where he was going out and he was really focusing on getting people and and getting the message out, we saw a shift with Mark showing us that Jesus really started to invest in all of his disciples. And so he starts really going deeper into the parables, trying to explain to them these certain things. And so we saw that from chapters 4 through 8, he's trying to build them up. Around chapter 5 and 6, he sends them out. And so we have this trying to get them to capture what he's doing, to understand the message and be able to share it themselves. After that, we go from verses 8 through 14, or chapters 8 through 14, where he starts challenging his disciples, try, trying to get them to, to understand their faith, because they started to get into the situation where they weren't understanding. They would take two steps forward and one step back. Sometimes they would take one step forward and three steps back. And it was just this constant, they just didn't understand what was going on. So Jesus kept challenging them and challenging them as they were going along. And then finally we get to chapters 14 through 15 where Jesus is arrested, tried, and crucified. And so we have this overarching idea. And really it's us walking with the disciples, It's us learning as they learn. Who is this Jesus? What is he requiring of us? What is he doing? And we get to watch it as he goes and he turns his attention from getting the message out to investing in his disciples to turning to the the cross and challenging them and then finally going to the cross. And today we're at that last point, that last chapter, where Jesus has risen. And so we're going to look at all this as one giant thing, all right? So the Bible's open to Mark chapter 6, 16, 16, 6. And people are going, wow, we don't want to go back. (laughs) All right, chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early in the, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You... Um, You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping 
when they heard that Jesus was alive, um, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus has spoken to them, he, is ta- he was taken into, up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Now, it might be hard to listen to that. It's even harder to read. <sighs> now, the thing is, is as we were reading, and if you have your Bibles, you might have noticed there's a little thing in between verses 8 and 9. It says, the most reliable... Uh, Early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but we need to address it because it's something that we need to address. And the question is, if other manuscripts, older manuscripts, don't have 9 through 20, why is it in there? Is it unbiblical? The answer is no, because we see in Matthew's Gospel, and we see at the beginning of Acts, that it has very similar language, very similar ideas, and so we know it's not unbiblical. So why is it in there? Why don't we just cut it out? Well, maybe we haven't found the translations that or the manuscripts that have it. Or it might just be to help us understand what was going on. Because, But no matter what, no matter what it is, why we have it there, it's there. And my thoughts is this. If God didn't want it there, I think he'd be able to cut it out. But the thing is, is if, we, if it's there or if it's not, it doesn't matter because we get the same understanding from the passage. And so I want to kind of look at that. Let's look at these two things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time up here because I'm trying not to, I'm, I'm not as good as the kids, so I'm not going to, you're not going to get as good as a thing. But from verses 1 through 8, I want us to kind of see what we get from these passages. From verses 1 through 8, we see this. We have no dialogue from Jesus, right? So if we ended with verse 8, we would have no dialogue from Jesus, okay? Uh, Another thing was Peter was specifically called out to be restored, okay? And finally, the gospel ends with a choice. So we have in this passage these women going to the tomb, and we don't get the other... um, the other details of the other Gospels. The other Gospels will tell us about the guards. The other Gospels will tell us about the conspiracies. But Mark doesn't do that. He just says they went and they didn't find Jesus. They, instead, they found this man who's an angel sitting there. And the angel tells him, Jesus isn't here. He's risen. Go. Go and tell the disciples. Tell specifically Peter. And then what do the ladies do? Well, they do the only sane thing you would do in that situation. You run away and you shut your mouth. Right? I mean, that, I don't know about you, but if I got into a situation where I assumed someone was dead and then I went to their gravesite and the grave was open and there was no one there, that might scare me. And I might run away and not tell anyone because you know what you tell someone when you see something that shouldn't happen? They call you crazy. Okay? And so you keep your mouth shut. And so the ladies had a choice at the end there. And so we have all these things. Jesus doesn't speak, which is really interesting, because we know there's more to the story. We go into Matthew, and there's more to the story. We go to Luke, there's more to the story. We go to John, there's more to the story. And we go to Acts, there's more to the story. So why does Mark not have his words spoken? And then we have Peter specifically being responsible. Restored because one thing we have to understand is Mark is writing from Mark uh, from Peter's perspective, and so whether it be Jesus or the angel specifically said Peter or Peter saying I know Jesus was restoring me at this moment. However, that is Peter is feeling that 
He understands the restoration, even though a couple chapters earlier, he completely denied Jesus. And he did, he just rejected him, just like the other disciples did. And so all the disciples are being restored, specifically Peter. And then finally, we have the choice of the ladies to either go and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen or go and be quiet. And so we have that. But then we go into the next part, and we get these three things. We find out the women did go and share, that they didn't just keep their mouths shut. Well, it was pretty good. It's a good idea. When an angel tells you to go do something, you should probably do it. Um, and so they go, and they actually share. And then we find out that the disciples, they don't believe. In fact, it says twice they don't believe. They don't believe the ladies, um, what they're saying, and they don't believe some other disciples that came along and who said, we saw Jesus, they don't believe them either. And so what we end up seeing when Jesus shows up is he rebukes them, he chastises them, he says, you don't believe, right? You didn't believe what these people said. And so he rebukes them for their unbelief. And then finally we get Jesus sending them out. We get Mark's version of the Great Commission. And so we have these things going on in the text, but I'm sorry, I'm not a very good preacher. I'm not a very good expositor of God's word because there's only one thing that I get at the end of this, and that's the choice that Mark presents to us. After all this, after all reading through this, I just had this one thing echoing in my mind, and that's the, the question that Jesus gives Peter back in chapter 8. Who do you say I am? It's almost like at the end of Mark, he's ending this with this idea of what do we do with this Jesus now? You know, if you write a paper, if you write a thesis paper, and you write this big, long essay, and you're doing all this work, at the very beginning you give your idea of what's going on, and at the end you give your conclusion. And for Mark it's almost like Jesus is this God who has come down and he has done all this stuff. Look at all this. Look at the things he has done. Now what are you going to do with him? About halfway through, Jesus asks the question. It's almost like Mark saying, okay, now what's your answer? What's your answer at the end? Because we can take this and this thing has been analyzed. It has been torn apart word for word, letter by letter. We can analyze as much we, as we want, but the thing that comes down to is what do we do with Jesus? What do we do with this person as presented to us? Do we believe that he is who he says he is, that he is the God who has come down to die on the cross for us? Or is he a prophet? You know, C.S. Lewis did it like this. He said, Jesus, there's only three options with Jesus. Either he's a liar, right, that he is a great liar, and that he has deceived countless people, and we're over here and we're deceived as well, and he's the greatest con man of all history. Or he's a lunatic, and he's just nuts, and you shouldn't believe him, just like you shouldn't believe him if he's a liar, but if he's a lunatic, it's even worse because now you're following a crazy person. And if you follow a crazy person, that means you're crazy. Or he's actually who he says he is. He's the Lord. He's God. There's only three options there. And if you go with the first two options, guess what? Jesus is nothing at that point. But if you go with the third one, that means we have to bow ourselves before him. And he, takes, he deserves everything from us. And so Mark leaves us with this question, what do you do with Jesus at the end? Because there's no middle ground here. We either have to reject Jesus or we embrace him. We either say he's completely off the wall, he's completely wrong, or we have to say no, he is completely right. If we say he's completely wrong, we can just continue our lives and we just keep going. We just do whatever we want. As Paul says, we eat, drink, and we be merry. But if he is who he says he is, that means everything in my life has to conform to him. It means everything about me needs to be submitted to Jesus. 
That means my thoughts, my feelings, my desires, my possessions, my relationships. It's all, it all has to be given to Jesus. And there's no middle ground there. And you know what? At the end here, I look at Mark and I look at disciples and this is what I get. To do what we're being asked to do, it's easier to just not believe. It's easier to not believe because how many times do people raise from the dead? I mean, I've done a couple of funerals. I've never seen anyone raised from the dead. That'd be really weird, right? It'd be strange. It'd be out of the ordinary. It'd be extraordinary. You know, it's easier to give in to what I desire than to help someone else. It's easier to not believe Jesus than it is to believe him. Because the belief requires so much more from me. The belief requires that I have to say, no, Jeremiah, you are not God. And I have to submit myself to him. And I have to agree with him that I am a sinner. I have to agree with this book that I am not the one that deserves heaven. I don't deserve God. Because of what I've done. I've done so many wrong things. In fact, we were just talking with the teenagers in our Sunday school about how this idea of sin and this idea of evil is really taking God's greatness and what he has done and making it less and retracting from it and making as if it was nothing. And I do that all the time. I retract from God's greatness. And I make it less than its perfection. I make it less than its glory. And I make it less and less. And I can't deal with that. And it's easier to not. I mean, think about it. When you wake up in the morning and you have your alarm clock, is it easier to smack it and say, no, I'm not getting out of bed? Or is it easier to get up and say, I'm ready for the day? I don't know. The other day I was supposed to go out with, um, um, my parents were down, and so we were supposed to have breakfast at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock is not that early. Me and my wife, we woke up at 7.45. And we have three kids. And, we, and because you know why? I had set my alarm for 6 o'clock. I, it went off. I hit it, it went off again, I hit it, because this action is easier than getting up. And it's the same with God. It's easier to reject it than it is to embrace it. Because the embracing means I have to recognize I am not who I think I am. And so... It's so much easier to not believe than it is to trust Jesus. But you know what? What I found in my own life is that when I do trust him, when I do agree with him, that's when things start making sense. That's when my relationships get better with people. That's when I don't get yelled at by my wife when when I'm spending too much because I'm not spending too much. And I'm in this relationship that is correct. And I'm doing these things that are right. I don't lie, and so I don't break relationships. I don't, I don't use my, my resources in a way that's improper because I'm agreeing with God that his way is better. And I'm going to him, and it actually it gets better. It's hard, but it's better. And so at the end of the book of Mark, when, when we're being asked... What are you going to do with this Jesus? Are you going to reject? Are you going to embrace? The easy thing is to say, I, I reject. But the greater thing is to accept. 
but that means that I can't continue to be me in the sense that I get to be my own God. I get to do things my way. I have to now say, no, Jesus, you are God, and I am not. So I submit to you. And that doesn't earn my way into heaven because Jesus already did everything for that. What that does is it says, I'm in the right spot. I'm in exactly the place I need to be for God to work in my life. The way that he is always meant to work in my life. To where he is my God and I am his child. Where he is my father and he is my Lord. And so at the end of Mark, we're left in this predicament. We're left in this spot. And so my challenge for you this week is very simple. I want to challenge you with this question. Where am I at in my relationship with God? If you have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're at the beginning. You haven't even started. You might know things about God, but you're not actually in the relationship with God. You have to recognize that we're sinners, that we fall short of the glory of God. That God has done everything for us. That Jesus came to die on the cross to save us. And we have to recognize what he has done for us. But I want to challenge you on something. I'm not going to have you raise your hand or stand up or anything. What I want to challenge you on is two things. One of two options. Either one, grab me after the service and we'll talk. Or two, explore on your own the arguments for God. Because I will tell you one thing, just this week, from Sunday through Friday, I had four different new understandings of God, just this week. And it was amazing. And it's through research and understanding, it's from his word, it's from science, it's from um, relationships, it's from all these different areas. Go and explore, because Scripture says, if you seek me, you will find. But if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, my challenge is still the same. Where are you at in your relationship with God? Is he a roommate right now? Is he a genie right now? Is he someone that's there that we pay lip service to, but he's not integral into our lives? No matter where we are at the end of Mark, whether we have accepted Jesus or we haven't, we still have the same, what do we do with this Jesus? What do we do with him? And so, and then after that, as a follow-up question, just where, where am I at? Am I where God wants me to be? Am I where God wants me to be? Is I asked this of myself this week. God, am I where you're at? Or where I'm supposed to be? And the answer was, not even close. <laughs> but I recognized that I said, and then I had this week of just amazing understanding. Because I asked this question, God, am I where I'm supposed to be? And then he showed me, he's like, yeah. You're here, and you're supposed to be over there. I'm like, I can't see that. He's like, exactly. Get on it. And it was an amazing week. And I want each of us to have weeks like that, to where we understand God on deeper levels, where we start viewing God more than just he's that guy up in the sky, that he is real and active and moving in our lives. This is where God desires to take us. And at the end of Mark, I see this in Jesus. When Jesus is, he sees his disciples and he rebukes them. And it's like, it's hard to be rebuked. It's hard to have someone say you're wrong. But then he takes them and he says, go. Go and do it. Everything I've given you, I've given you everything. And now I'm going to be with you for all. And go, let's do this. Fulfill the call I have on your life.
So my challenge for you this week is that. Fulfill the call on your life that Jesus has called you to, that he has saved you to. Not to be someone that just has this idea of God, but someone who is active in the work of God. Because that's where God desires us. Right there in the trenches, fighting and not giving up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, I pray for everyone in here. I don't know where their spiritual lives are. I don't know how close or how far they are from you. I do know this. You want us closer. You want us to know you more. You want us to desire you more. And you've given us your spirit to do and to accomplish everything you have called us to do. So, Father, I pray for everyone in here that you would do just that. That you would empower us to know you in greater depth. That we would come to you and that we would be humbled before you. And that we would thank you and praise you. And that we would be sent out to go and to be a part of your work as you build your church, that we would be a part of that. So I thank you in your son's name. Amen. Have thine own way. Usually I ask Jeff to take the offering, and so, but I, I want to do it today um, because I want to share some things with you. So if we could have the ushers come on up. I just got this this morning. Um, we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, uh, if you don't know. Um, if you have questions about that and you're brand new, we have bags for you. So if you're brand new, please pick up a bag. Um, it has a lot of the information, more than I can tell you right now. But we're part of a worldwide group called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and our goal as a denomination is to plant churches to equip the people of that nation to run their own national church, and then we leave, and we go to the next one. And that's the goal of the CMA, is to help that. And right now, we're putting a lot of effort into what's called the 420 window, which is about the um, Middle East. But I, I just want to give you a couple of things. And this is not to toot the horn of the alliance, okay? Don't think that I'm going to share this, and we're so much better than every other denomination. We are, but that's not why I'm sharing it, okay? okay? And you see how they laugh? That was a joke. So don't walk away upset, okay? In the United States, 
we have about 400,000 worshipers, okay? That's about 2,000 churches, all right? It's not, we're not focused on the United States, though we do work here. Obviously, we're here, right? Okay. But I want to give you what's going on in the rest of the world. Right now, we have done 60 national churches. So 60 countries have their own national churches, okay? Out of that, there are 23,000 churches that we've planted, okay, worldwide in 81 countries. That means that right now, as you worship together, you're worshiping with about 6 million other alliance people, okay? Now, that's not, I mean, the Southern Baptists are a lot bigger than that. But the goal of this is to reach people. And so when we're taking these offerings, it has nothing to do with about building buildings. I'm of the opinion, and Marika says I shouldn't say this out loud, but I'm of the opinion that I would rather have this place burned down, this, this building, than to us to think that this is the church. Amen. God's people is the church, and we want to reach people. We want lives changed. We want people to come to know Christ. That is the goal. Building buildings is an afterthought. And so when we take these offerings, that's our goal with it. That people would be reached, that Christ would be proclaimed, and that the kingdom would have just one more person. And so that's what we're doing. So let's pray. Lord, this is yours. You've given it to us. We're giving back. But it's all yours. So, Father, use it. Use it how you would. Use it here in this community of Quartzsite. Use it in this state of Arizona. Use it in this nation. Use it in this world. Use it however you want it to be used. Let us not hold on to it so that we would be empowered, but let us give it to you so that you would use it, that we would humbly give it to you so that, not because you need it, but because it puts us smack in the middle of the work that you have called us to. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that they would have opportunities to share with their neighbors, their friends, and their family. I pray for my brothers and sisters across this world those who are right now struggling, who are being beat, who are being in prison. Father, I pray this would be used so that they would know that they have um, an extended family that cares for them. And Father, I pray for those that have not accepted you, that we be people willing to be used to speak to them, to tell them that there is a God who loves them, that Jesus has died for them, and that together we can impact other people. That the only way for them to know this God is through his son. And so, Father, I ask that. I ask all that and that you would use everything that we give you. From the penny to the dollar. It would all be used for you, for your kingdom. Mm-hmm. In your son's name, amen. Amen. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the graceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me.
you stand with us, please? Glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was a blood of pride. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was a blood of abides within there at the cross where he took me in glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of life glory to his name and you know Jeremiah asked the question that we ought to ask ourselves daily. Where am I? Am I enjoying the presence of God? If I'm not, what am I doing? Where am I? What? What? How can I? How can I? God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And what do we have going tonight? Bonfire. Bonfire. Bring your own chair. God bless. We'll see you tonight at 6.